and I'm just waiting for a quorum to be established before we get started. So we'll wait a couple more minutes. Before we get started, why don't I read uh, this announcement and then we can hopefully have quorum established by the time I'm finished, so I'll read slowly. Thank you, Councilmember Mayhan, for being here. I know Councilmember Esparza is out sick today, so we need one other person to establish quorum, which means we can do some work once a quorum established. Otherwise, we can just listen to reports and that's about it, I, I believe. So, uh, but let me get started with this statement first, and this is our code of conduct statement. I want to remind the committee and uh, members of the public to follow the code of conduct at this meeting. This includes commenting on the specific item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the council members, board members, commissioners, or staff. All members of the committee staff and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, conduct which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in removal from this meeting. This meeting of the Community and Economic Development Committee will now come to order. Can the clerk take the roll or do we have quorum yet? We don't have quorum. Have quorum. We, we do or we don't? Yes, I believe we do. Perales just joined. Yes. Oh, okay, wonderful. Then could you take the roll, please? Carrasco? Perales? Here. Mahan? Here. Foley? Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, we have, uh, the first thing is to review the work plan. There are two items on the, re on the work plan that have both been dropped. The first is a work to future annual report that was dropped per the rules committee. Uh, and really that's because we had a report from them not that long ago and there's nothing has occurred to update us in uh, what work to future is up to. So that has been dropped per rules. Also the next item, which is downtown and regional mm -hmm. wayfinding that has been dropped for this fiscal year, but we will be hearing it at this committee in October of this year, 2022. So uh, I will turn to public comments. Please uh, keep your public comments to those specific work item, work plan items. And with that, uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, happy meeting to everyone. Uh, happy end of May to everyone, May 2022. I was interested and curious if the wayfinding efforts uh, is a part of, say, the kiosks that are going to go up downtown that can give information to people. And uh, if that is what this item is about, uh, I think those kiosks can be a wonderful idea to. Um, work as a way to describe what exactly is you know the open public policies and practices that uh, san jose will be following uh so when you read the information you also will be aware that there is, there's an open uh, accountable process that is a part of the whole technology iot system that's being created for the downtown area and uh for people to be aware of that, I think just would make them happy. I think they would just 
feel relief and interest. And it would just be um, part of an overall, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, holistic process of, of building a future of innovation and community that I think is uh, really important and, and necessary and meaningful. And that's what would get people to more come to San Diego. They'd want to be around it and they'd want to, you'd have interesting people who want to be around that process. So good luck uh, how to introduce open public policies and accountability practices to the wayfinding kiosks uh, for the future of the downtown area. Thank you. Seeing no other public comment, I'll go to the committee and request a motion to accept the work plan, the modifications to the work plan. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Then clerk, will you take the roll please? Carrasco? Aye. Perales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. Moving on to the reports to the committee, we have an economic development activities report from Elizabeth. We haven't seen you for a couple of months, so I understand there's a lot going on. So take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, yes, there is a lot. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. Elizabeth Handler, I'm the Public Information Manager, Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And it has been a busy, roughly quarter, the, the months are a little fluid, in, uh, in our department with both events and activities going on in person for a change now, and also the, uh, the other kinds of communications around uh, financial help for small businesses. So one of the most important announcements we've made recently is the city's grant program for small businesses looking to help, for help with um, past due rent. And it's all part of an effort to curtail any kind of commercial eviction wave, which would damage not only the small businesses, but also the property owners in town, whom many of whom are moms and pops themselves. And those properties are the, the family's wealth. So this grant program is in operation now. They're taking applications through the end of May. And so far we have um, probably about 150 applications or pre-application questionnaires finished. And I think about 60 actual applications in house. And the final uh, alloco allocation of the funds will be by lottery, which is an interesting approach, which means that the folks who get in at the last minute maybe had trouble applying are not penalized. So that's going on and it's an exciting program. Um, we also now have our projects report of the development activities, the major activities around town with some important commercial developments happening, including the um, West Bank and um, Coleman High Line, um, and then also the master development uh, proposal for the flea market. So we're working on those, but the full report includes an interactive map and details on the residential developments as well as um, the hotel and other kinds of development. So that's a, a must read. We had an interesting partnership with Facebook just recently, which was open to both small businesses who need help with becoming more digital in their marketing and also for young adults who are interested in internships. And with working with Work to Future, this matches up the young adults who get training, and then they go and help the small businesses uh, become more adept at digital marketing and communications. So that's going on right now. Oh, and it's a trained in internship as well. They get $500 for, uh, um, for doing it. Um, well, the, excuse me, the businesses get a $500 um, credit and the interns are paid at a, a weekly, a, a very good weekly salary. We also wanted to share what we've been doing in our business walks. Uh, we've been doing these since the beginning of May last year. And it is a group of anywhere from three to eight people from our business development unit going out to commercial districts and neighborhoods with small businesses all over the city. And I know I can see 
council member may I'm trying very hard to read the list. <laughs> I apologize. It's very small, but the blog post, if you click on the blog post, you'll be able to access the full list. And um, we're covering, we've covered all the districts so far, some more than others, simply because of the difference in impact of COVID on various neighborhoods. But it is our goal to reach out to all the, all the neighborhoods. We are not only just spreading the word of what um, projects and what support is available, but we're also collecting information on what the businesses are most concerned about. And one of the issues is definitely the impact of homelessness on commercial neighborhoods. And so we're including some more support for that in our ongoing communications to small businesses. We now have a partnership working with Start Small, Think Big to be able to support small businesses with their relationships with their uh, landlords and helping them become a little bit more savvy in terms of real estate and being able to be um, both less vulnerable to eviction, but also more able to negotiate and manage um, the, the implications of where they have to do, to do business. So that we're starting with a series of webinars on it, as well as a hotline that's available to small business owners for free hands-on advice. Very long post about a meeting that we had with flea market vendors in February at the flea market, where we were able to share with the vendors the progress that we've made working with the Berryessa Flea Market uh, Vendors Association in moving towards what the council directed us to do, which is to help create an advisory group that will be uh, responsible for making decisions about the disbursement of the funds that were developed um, from the owners of the flea market and the city to help them transition through the development phase that the market is going through over the next you know, three to 10 years. Um, it's, a, it's a long horizon. But the vendors are very concerned, and um, you heard a you heard their report last last month about that, and I think you got the flavor. But then we were able to have this meeting, which was very successful as far as we were concerned. We got very valuable f um, feedback from the vendors. Um, this is a, a grant program that came and went, but it was the first city grant program that we did, or the county grant program for micro loans to small businesses. And um, that came and went and the loans were dispersed. But again, this was for you know small, small grants, about $2,500. And then finally, we have a guest blog post from Rick Jensen, the communications director at the San Jose Downtown Association, detailing some of the kind of activation and experiential aspects of the recovery as downtown is experiencing it, including the um, San Pedro Square Market activation, which I think everybody agrees is, an, is enormous, as well as Post Street, and the um, advances in new businesses opening up in, in San Jose, along with Mama Kin going into the um, Cafe Stretch location. And I can share that that opening will be June 6th. I mean, excuse me, June 3rd coming up. So watch your calendars for that. That should be exciting to have that open and active again on South First Street. And with that, that's the end of my report. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, turning to members of the public first, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for this item. Um, you know, if, during uh, March and April, I felt there was a really interesting uh, growth uh, and a way of talking about programs uh, in San Jose at, at, at committee meetings. And this returns to those kind of good subject matter. This is positive and it's constructive, I think. it's uh, So thanks a lot. Uh, uh, good items. The items of, say, um, that I was interested in, uh, the San Jose program where uh, small business owners can, can call a toll-free hotline if they have any questions and, ha and want some sort of one-on-one -on -one assistance. 
about their small business needs. Um, that's interesting stuff. That's that's new and helpful. And um, you know, you have some sort of uh, loan programs for small businesses that are going on, uh, a project report and uh, uh, rent debt. And, and I think there's also a way that uh, uh, small business owners to talk about using the toll free number to say talk about uh, their tenants issues. Um, really helpful. Thank you. Um, about the uh, flea market issues. Um, uh, you know, good luck with that. Good luck with how I, I think that uh, flea market vendors, I think can actually have a right to consider, you know, uh, a bit more room for the future of flea market vending space. And from that, you know, possibly how to develop what exactly the, the place will look like and how it will be designed in the future. I think vendors can have a really important voice and good voice to in the future design of what exactly uh, this area will, will look like. So good luck in those sort of efforts and dialogue and uh, thanks a lot for this item. Thank you. Turning to the committee, does anyone have any comments or wish to make a motion to accept the report? Council member Mahan. Thanks, Chair. I'll make a motion in just a moment. Elizabeth, I, thank you for the report. I, I was just curious if you could give us a little more context on the conversations with the vendors. Specifically, you said you, you got some great feedback from the vendors at the flea market. I was just curious if you could share maybe a little one, one more degree of detail around kind of what, what you're hearing and, and what their priorities are at the moment. Sure, council member, I'm very happy to. Um, I think it was abundantly clear to us at that meeting, although we knew this from working with the vendor association, that the concern among the vendors regarding their future is acute. And from our perspective, maybe it's unwarrantedly acute because we understand that the operators and the owners of the property um, can't evict anybody uh, for a year after they have filed a their their development application and that's probably a year plus away in and of itself so we know it's not happening tomorrow the vendors don't have that luxury they're they're just terrified and so part of what we're trying to do is to um kind of help them take a deep breath and find ways in which they can strengthen their business operations and the, uh, the way that they're able to earn a living right now um, as we go through this development process, which is gonna be a long time. And Nancy can speak more to that. I think the other issue that has come up clearly to us is that they feel that they have no control over their, their lives as tenants of the flea market right now. And they desperately want it. They wanna be able to guide their own destinies, um, operate their own flea market. And as anybody knows who's worked in this area, that's a huge, huge step. But we're working very hard towards helping them realize what the challenges are as well as what the opportunities are there. So I don't know if Nancy, you want to speak more to that because she's been deeply involved. A lot of good things. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. A lot of good things going on. <clears throat> Additional services technical services, exploration of loan products uh, that may well be the first for San Jose that we could think about yet, including to other small businesses beyond that. So we're, we're taking the opportunity to look at this as a way to infuse new uh, and helpful um, support for small business. And then thinking as mentioned, and Mr. Beekman mentioned about what, what is possible on site for the vendors? And then is there uh, an opportunity off site? And we are hiring consultants uh, as specified in the action by council last year. Great, thanks for the additional context. Appreciate getting a slightly fuller update there. I, I know my colleague has his hand up. I'll go ahead and move the report, assuming he's gonna be okay with that. And then I'll, uh, that'll be it for me, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second. Thank you. Council Member Perales. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick note. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, who mentioned it, but 
we are excited and so i'm inviting everybody from this committee and anybody else who can make it 5 p.m next friday june 3rd is the uh grand opening uh or ribbon cutting for mama kin uh as uh, this was said taking over for formerly cafe stretch which was uh, a big bummer to to lose that venue um so it'd be great to you know continue the support and, and see that this new business uh, thrives with with live music uh, continuing there in that spot. So just give everybody that heads up. That's it. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Councilmember Carrasco. Hi. Thank you, uh, uh, and I I want to thank you for the report. Uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, on a couple of questions regarding the flea market vendors, if you will. Uh, just a couple of uh, concerns that were raised. Um, and were brought to my attention by uh, some of the advocates. Of course, I know that Nancy has already heard them, and I know we've talked about it in the past, but if you could just uh, give me an update on some of the concerns that the vendors have brought up regarding, uh, you know, the, the parking fees and the entrance fees and uh, some of the, the concerns that I know that you've heard about as well, Nancy. I know that this, this poses a, a hardship for the, the vendors as they're, facing some uncertainty of, of their future? Yes, council member, thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit more about that. Um, the challenge, yes, the vendors are concerned about having harder economic impacts than they currently are experiencing. Um, the, the parking and or uh, uh, $300 stall fee that was added um, the city is extremely limited um, to almost no inter, quote unquote, interference between a business owner and their tenant. Um, very different than a, a landlord who has housing or particularly affordable housing there. Um, so th the notion of um, loans, um, which people are are concerned about taking, they they welcome the technical assistance and potentially the loans, uh, but very much wanting to continue to make their livelihood uh, and look to ways to expand. One of the other issues, which would be great for your offices, if you'd be so kind, is for some reason some folks in all of the action that took place last year think that the market has closed or is closing. So part of what we're trying to do is um, continue the information that the market is indeed open and to come enjoy um, the market and bring your family, have fun and entertainment. Uh, so that is an effort that we're participating with the vendors as well. Uh, oh. Nancy, I'm not... So I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I didn't quite follow and I, I maybe oh, I wasn't very clear. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm unclear as to, as to uh, the, the response. So uh, what I was asking was uh, about, the, about the additional fees that have been imposed and whether there is any, uh, if there's been any resolution or if we know that these fees are going to continue to uh, burden the, the, the tenants? Sure, Council Member, I'm sorry if I, I wasn't clear. The yeah. city, unfortunately, has no ability to step in between the owner of the flea market and the vendors. And there were, um, and I could certainly provide to you and or other committee members, the the owners pointed out that it had been quite a number of years before they raised parking fees at all. Um, and, in, and they gave fees in line with showing that they were still less than other markets in the area, be it the Berkeley flea market or the Capitol flea market, et cetera. But after having extensive conversations with our city attorney's office, um, we, we do not, as a city, have an avenue to make the old property owner do something different. Right. I, I understand that. 
and and I understand the, the studies and I understand the comparisons and everything. I, I do, however, think that when we we have these reports, um, uh, I think we have to be you know upfront and say you know and and uh, and recognize that not everything is you know uh, going. Uh, perfectly well. Um, it's not a smooth uh, transition. Uh, they are struggling. Uh, this is what I'm hearing directly from, um, from the vendors. Uh, I want to be very clear and I want to be very transparent. There is a gentleman that works for me now, one of my staffers, Roberto, uh, who's presented, uh, co-presented with you and he is part of the um, flea market vendors association and I want to be very clear and I want to make sure that I uh, I go on record uh, he and I do not have conversations about what's happening at the flea market because um, he wants to preserve his job and so he's built a firewall uh, around these conversations so the individuals that I'm having a conversation with uh, are outside of uh, Roberto uh, and, and I've told him that off hours, he can come to me and he still has not come to me, uh, which I think is uh, actually a, a, a tragedy in and of itself, because I think that he's one of the best advocates. And I think that he should feel free to come to me on his off hours and advocate for his uh, association. But anyway, I have other community folks that are coming to me and, and talking to me about this. And so uh, what I'm hearing is uh, that that uh, there, there is some uh, impact on the vendors um, because of these fees. And so regardless of uh, the comparison, uh, given, given the, the high cost of living and everything else that we know about San Jose, um, I do think that we, that needs to be baked into the reports when we talk about um, the, the progress and the support that we're giving our vendors, that this is an impact on their livelihood. Uh, I also think that, you know, uh, that we should have a friendly conversation. There's no way of twisting the arms of the Baum family. Um, but I think that a friendly conversation about how could we better support uh, the vendors who, who, you know, for uh, over 60 years, uh, help the Bum family build a dynasty that they get to uh, enjoy for generations to come in their own personal wealth. And, uh, and now they will be displaced no matter which way we look at it, no matter which way we cut it, no matter which way we want to uh, portray it, no matter which way we want to paint it, uh, they will get displaced and the Bum family will do very well for themselves uh, after all of this is said and done. And so um, I, I think that they they could, uh, you know, they could potentially uh, look to see how they could ease the burden and allow them to figure out how to secure uh, a, a more, um, I don't even want to say profitable future for the vendors, but at least a, a, a future that would allow them to just secure their livelihood. Additionally, I want to say that one of the things that was very disturbing to me was that uh, some of the, the, their costs for doing business has gone up because uh, they don't have a lease, they have a license. Of course, I'm not a lawyer, um, but there are some marked differences from my understanding, at least what's been told to me. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, it's been, it's been explained that it's because of the uh, cost of doing business has gone up also for the Bum family. Uh, maintenance has gone up, yet some of these vendors still don't have electricity uh, for them to conduct business in the middle of the afternoon as it gets darker. And in addition, some folks have been asked to vacate or uh, to terminate their, their business practice because suddenly certain rules have been changed on them after they've it conducted business there for over 30 years, uh, conducting business in the same manner, and suddenly the rules are, are changed up on them. And so uh, they're okay following the rules from what I've been told. You know, they say, you know, we'll follow the rules. Just tell us what the rules are and give us a fair warning 
and we'll follow those rules. Uh, but but what I'm hearing is, uh, you know, suddenly they're they're you know playing hardball from one day to the next. And so, uh, if you could offer any suggestions on how we can help mediate that, uh, or how we can, um, you know, really support vendors uh, who are having a, a hard time understanding uh, where this is coming from. Council member, thank you very much for, for the passion um, and the, the direction. I, I want to just ask a quick question. I think you, you were not able to be at committee um, when, when the vendor uh, report was given. I, I think that may be so. And what I'd like to no, do. No, I was, I, was, I was there. I was oh, there. Were there. I was, was going to say. By the way, Nancy, this was just reported to me maybe three or four days ago. I see. So, and I'm happy offline to also come. There was, um, you may recall, apologize for, for not recalling in more detail that you were there, but um, there was quite a bit of extensive conversation that Roberto on behalf of the vendors shared that um, are troubling and difficult. And by no means are we trying to say that all is good. All is really hard. Um, there are some, um, highlights in that the Vendors Association is strengthening as an organization. We are investing in, in Roberto and other leaders. Roberto, and I totally respect and know, council member, that there's no uh, stepping over the bright line between this issue and your office. That said, Roberto is an a, is a amazing young leader, and investing in him um, is, is just smart uh, uh, not only for the Vendors Association, but for the area. Um, we have spoken with Eric uh, directly, um, and I believe that the best we have been able to accomplish to date is to have no further imposition of, of fees that may be, have been contemplated. And we have also shared the concerns about maintenance um, very directly with Eric to go back to the family. So um, I, I wanna just let you know, we are very directly speaking to the family um, that we're aware so that they, the owners aren't in some reason, for some reason thinking that we don't see the concerns. Right, I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and we can, Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And, and we can have a, a conversation uh, uh, offline, but I'm, I'm uh, glad to hear that, that that's taking place. Thank you. That's Anything else, Council Member Carrasco? No, no, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate the, the rest of the report as well. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. It sounds like there's a lot of good activity uh, and some things we need to watch at the flea market, definitely. We will get another annual report on the flea market based on our work plan for 2223. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when that is, but it's probably less than a year since we just had the last one last month. We'll probably have another one. We'll, we'll check that out and you'll get a copy of the work plan when it's, when it's available. With that, I see no other hands raised. Uh, if we, clerk, if we could take the uh, take the vote. Carrasco. Aye. Perales. Yes. Mayhem. Aye. Foley. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the report, Elizabeth. Next is a report on the housing crisis work plan prioritized item status report. I understand Jared Ferguson is gonna kick us off. There you are. Hi, good afternoon. Let me share my screen here with the slides. Uh, Jared Ferguson, Housing Catalyst with the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. I'm with joined with Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department, and Michael Brio, Deputy Director in Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. We're here today to provide you with an update on, pro on our progress implementing the Housing Crisis Work Plan. 
first adopted in 2018, the housing crisis work plan is intended to help encourage the goal of 25,000 housing units by 2023 that have received planning approval are under construction or are complete. This includes 15,000 market rate units and 10,000 affordable units. This first chart shows the progress towards that goal through March of 2022. This chart with two additional charts is included as attachment B to the staff report. As we've noted in previous reports, the city has met the goal for market rate housing by exceeding 15,000 market rate units, although we know there is more to be done to ensure units continue to move along through the process to completion. The city has made progress on affordable, particularly in the last two years, and has achieved roughly one third of its goal, but it will not achieve the full goal by 2023. This next chart shows the number of units issued building permits. This data is important as it represents the start of new construction and is the best indicator of current economic conditions. 2021 exceeded 2020, but was still far behind 2018 and 2019. 2022 so far has followed a similar trend as 2021. There was one significant market rate multifamily project that started construction in 2021 and one in the first quarter of 2022. Otherwise, production has been buoyed by ADUs with 464 permitted in 2021 and already 177 through March of this year. Rents remain high in San Jose and rent growth has been positive year over year, increasing 14% from last year, but still about 1% behind March 2020 at the start of the pandemic. The rent growth is a positive for potential market rate development, but construction costs have continued to escalate significantly throughout the pandemic. These underlying factors coupled with continued uncertainty has made new market, straight, new market rate construction challenging. More recently, rising interest rates may also contribute to new challenges for market rate construction. We'll now hand it over to Rachel to continue the presentation. Thank you, Jared. Again, my name is Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. As Jared just mentioned, um, the same is true with affordable housing. The number of permits, uh, building permits, is a strong indicator of um, upcoming affordable housing to our community. We currently have five affordable housing developments under construction. This includes Allen Rock Family, Aria, Page Street, Blossom Hill Senior Apartments, and the Gallup and Mesa development. The critical factor for affordable housing developments to achieve in order to pull their building permits is to close their financing. Over the past two years, our developments have been challenged in securing bond allocations from the California Debt Allocation Committee, or affectionately known as SIDLAC. Therefore, the number of building permits is limited to those developments who have received allocations. I wanna share with all of you, we were successful in securing four allocations in the most recent round, but the difficult reality is that costs are increasing and financing is tightening due to increased interest rates. And now we actually have a real concern that two of those four may not be in a position to close their financing in the amount of time that's required by SIDLAC. This um, SIDLAC is actually having, calling a special meeting this week on Wednesday to try and figure out how they're going to deal with this issue we have these troubled developments in San Jose, but there are others across the state. And so the development community has asked them to look into really two things. One is an extension for more time that will allow developers to try and put all these pieces together that um, have been wobbling the last few weeks. So that's one strategy. The second strategy is actually to dampen the penalty for not closing on time. So right now what happens is if a developer 
has to basically give back a SIDLAC allocation because they're not able to close in the required time frame, they receive a strong penalty, which is negative points for two years. So what that means is that affordable housing development essentially will not be able to receive any sort of SIDLAC allocation for a period of two years. So there's also a request for SIDLAC to basically waive those penalties so that developers don't have to be um, in such a bad position for not closing on time right now. So again, I just wanted to raise this. Um, we were really hopeful that our number for 2022 would be able to include four more um, developments that could pull their building permits. But at this point, we are concerned um, that may be limited to um, just two. Um, and we still have to figure out how we're going to pull the other two together. So, um, all right, next slide. Now this is a, this slide focuses on some policy accomplishments that we have done. The last two were just really focused on production. So I am happy to report that we were able to bring forward changes to the commercial linkage fee program. And I'm very happy to let you all know we received our first commercial linkage fee payment. Um, it came in. And what was really interesting for, you know, if you remember all the details of this conversation, what we did is we actually, city council approved um, like an incentive to pay the, the commercial linkage fee at building permit, which, you know, um, as staff reviewed the process is really the ideal time to receive the payment. And um, that is exactly what happened with our first payment. It was paid because it was paid um, at building permit and they were really incentivized to receive um, the 80% fee that came along with paying at that point in time. So we're very happy to report that. Um, additionally, uh, we were able to move forward eliminating commercial space requirements for affordable housing development. This has been a, kind of an ongoing conversation for a long period of time, and we feel like um, this was a, um, a, a strong accomplishment and something included in our work plan for quite some time. And also, we were able to reimagine underutilized business corridors for allow, allowing for housing. So these are all things that um, we are very happy, have been able to move forward, and we look forward to the results um, in the, in the future coming from these changes. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Michael. Thank you, Rachel. Michael Brea, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. Um, so, hang on one second. There we go. Um, so uh, the big focus of the planning department, the citywide team, as well as the housing's policy team, is to complete the uh, housing element. That's our A number one assignment as part of the housing crisis and actually otherwise. And so um, we're moving forward with that. The draft element is anticipated to be completed and brought to council for consideration in April of next year. A big part of that work, which is, a, which is new, it originally came from the Obama administration, Trump got rid of it. The California uh, continues to maintain this requirement, and that and that is to do an assessment of fair housing to address uh, past uh, racial discrimination and segregation, and to create a pathway for a more equitable and inclusive city of San Jose. So that's a big part of our work that we'll be doing as we identify sites for affordable housing and a work program to further implement our goals and our housing element. Um, as part of this work, we're, looking, we're doing public participation across uh, all economic segments and particularly focusing on hard, hard to reach groups as well. And just a note because of, um, which I'll get to more in a minute, but because of the priority of the housing element, it's meaning we've had to reallocate staff within both on the housing department side and the planning department side to focus on the housing element and 
and not to uh, focus on the work that they were doing prior. So that is impacting, uh, housing element is impacting some of the other assignments that both our departments have. Next slide. So related to this, I just wanna note that the citywide planning team lost over 40% of its staff from the fall to the winter of 2022. It's a significant loss. Um, we are actively recruiting and have filled four vacancies. We're still recruiting for three senior planners and two planners. Um, so, so, we're, uh, so the vacancies as well as turnover, so mind you, it's not just the fact that you don't have bodies, but you have experienced staff that left. And as we fill them, we often are getting people that are, are starting out their career or at least new to the city. So we, it, it takes time to train them and bring them on board. That is affecting some of our project timelines. Some of the housing crisis work programs in the memo are being delayed or are temporarily on, on hold due to um, the lack of staff that we currently have in combination with us needing to, to reallocate resources to focus on the housing element. Next slide. So I just wanna highlight some of the things in our work program. Um, one of them is, is Yigby, a land affordable housing on assembly use sites. This includes all assembly uses most commonly thought of as places of worship. Um, that work actually is going forward. That's one of the items where we, we are, are still uh, doubling down and working on. Uh, where we are with that currently is um, developing the project description for CEQA and the CEQA process. Um, we anticipate we would bring a policy back to council for its consideration early next year. Um, and the primary driver of this work really actually is the, the CEQA. So that's that's um, what's taking the amount of time that's needed to complete this work. Um, the other the other item that we got council direction to do and is in our work program, and we were actually working on this, was to explore uh, a policy that would allow housing and other non-PQP uses on public school lands. Um, we affectionately call this YOSOL. So YOSOL is on hold due to, originally, initially it was on hold because of concern by the school districts um, on this and their need to get students back into school um, in the COVID pandemic. Um, but more recently, it's because of, of staffing issues. We've had to put this item on the hold. We anticipate uh, starting this one up again once uh, Yigby is completed and council has made a decision on what to do with Yigby and then we'll move next on to Yosol. The other uh, work plan highlight or item I wanna just mention really quickly um, is council direction to apply the mobile home park land use designation on the remaining, I think it's 56 mobile home parks in San Jose. Um, and so that's that's work. We, we put out a memo in 2018 that outlines the resources that we would need. It, it's included in this memo as well, um, that, that staff, both housing department and planning would need to, to complete that work. Um, this is some an item that potentially we could get to in, in, a, in a year and a half or so as the aligning the general plan with the, zo the zoning with the general plan team winds down that work, they, they could take up this work. We would still need additional research, resources for CEQA. Housing would need resources as well. Um, but you know, the key item is we, we need resources to do this work. And so um, that, that's up to the council's decision to, 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 do, to give us those resources. Next slide. And I think this goes back to you, Jared. Thanks, Michael. Um, so since its creation, the housing crisis work plan has contained an evolving list of strategies to increase housing production, or in some cases to preserve existing affordable units with an overall goal of delivering 25,000 new units by 2023 with 15,000 market rate and 10,000 affordable. The city is currently in, an, in the final year of that timeline. Based on the production we are reporting, the city has met its goal of 15,000 market rate units that have received planning approval or under construction or have been completed. However, the city is short of its goal of 10,000 affordable units. And although the goal for market rate was met, there is still more the city must do to continue to encourage production of market rate housing and even more work to be done towards the production of affordable housing. Implementation of the work plan is managed through the housing catalyst team. The team meets on a bi-monthly basis and is composed of staff from the business and economic development team and the office of economic development and cultural affairs 
the citywide planning division and the department of planning building and code enforcement the policy and planning and residential development divisions in the housing department and the strategic planning team in the department of parks recreation and neighborhood services the creation of this interdepartmental housing catalyst team has led to greater collaboration and served as a valuable place to pool knowledge and resources around individual issues staff intends to bring forward a report directly to the city council later this fall that will propose to close out the housing crisis work plan but have its work items and process evolve into the housing catalyst team work plan moving forward into 2023 in this form the work plan would be even more closely aligned with the city's new housing element and its proposed strategies along with its annual reporting the city's new six cycle regional housing needs allocation or rena would serve as the unit goal this new form would allow the city to continue with the most useful elements of the housing crisis work plan one of which has been our interdepartmental team interdepartmental housing catalyst team focused on the policies and programs in the work plan then additionally the work plan itself would continue as a unified location for staff the city council and the public to understand and track what work is being pursued related to housing in san jose and with that that concludes our presentation Wonderful. Uh, thank you for the report. Very informative. Uh, moving to members of the public. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders. I just wanted to thank this, uh, thank those that just gave this report and including the mobile home uh, efforts that will be taking place over the next 18 months actually excuse me not until 18 months is what I gathered from another meeting that I was in so I hope somebody will on the council excuse me on on this committee will ask these questions because we have been waiting for this uh, unanimous council vote to to apply a mobile home land use designation through the 56 mobile home parks. We've been waiting for this, as you know, since 2020. And we know that there are staffing shortages. We know there are issues, but this goes back. And if you look at the history of mobile home parks, really, when I say history, I mean from like the 1970s <laughs> and the efforts in the 90s to, to change them into other things and then having to reapply protections and then them being taken off again for the 2040 plan and now having to have protections again. I just hope that you know that we all know the history and we are paying attention and we are grateful that these efforts will be made, but we really want to make sure that this committee and the entire council and the entire housing department and the planning department know that it matters greatly to us that this happens. And so I do hope we can find the resources for this and the people involved to make this happen because securing um, these units and making sure that we're preventing displacement is one of the really only actually one of the most important things that we can do during this crisis. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jill. Not, not to mention that mobile homes are amongst the most affordable housing available right now. Uh, next caller is Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the words of Jill Borders. It was nice uh, she could offer something just specific that uh, yourselves can work on in housing. That was interesting words. Thank you. Um, for myself, uh, I guess I can just go over a list of, of you know, the things that I, I try to bring up that I think are important to work on. Good luck on, on dealing with this this uh, affordable housing uh, financing issue that's going on. I don't know, this sounds like a long-term problem that's coming up right now. And good luck how you can really address it and, and find relief that can be for the long-term and, and good good ideas for, for a long-term planning. Uh, we shouldn't lose affordable housing and we don't have to do it cheaply. Uh, we can do it a process well to include. Um, the subsidy process, um, has made decision making a little different for ourselves at this time. Uh, a reminder and importance of uh, good practices we already have, and that the future of subsidy for, say, uh, the um, I can't think of what they're called, the, the, the very specific housing, the you know, the enclosed housing. Uh, I can't remember its name right now. 
but for that you know very specialized form of housing that's being developed all around the city at this time that doesn't have to be fully subsidized and and you know uh, it's it's uh vetting process doesn't have to be efficient made more efficient to expedite it uh bringing in the housing better or easier faster um, those are very high-end developers, and they're not going to be really searching for really low-income housing for the future of that housing. We need to work on that kind of stuff and make sure that extremely low, very low, and mixed income is always important. Thank you. Turning to the committee, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the, the presentation. Um, I am curious. Uh, because the, uh, as we just saw in the presentation, heard uh, on this mobile home work, uh, I also was not aware that we're looking at another eighteen months potentially before we can. Uh, tell me if I heard it correctly. Before we would start the work, is that correct? Yeah. So I think the message back in twenty eighteen, frankly, was we couldn't start the work at all until we get resources from council. And there was a memo we put out that estimated it was around $350,000 that we would need. Um, and we still need resources from the council to do this work. Um, I think where we're at, where, where we're at, the thinking at the moment is that as the team completes the rezonings per requirements of state law, that that staff could transition to start doing general plan and then in some mobile home parks when you know that that would that would probably be about a year and a half from now when they could start to transition over we will still need money from council to do that work because there's CEQA in 2018 the estimate was around one hundred and ten thousand dollars I'm sure you know if you add in inflation it's higher than that and there's also some other related costs so we would need money money for council even in if we were to start them with work 18 months from now. Okay, that that is helpful. Um, is there a reason why this was not on the list of the priority items, the, the backlog, you know, um, priority items or initiatives where we would then decide, is that because essentially is this saying, hey, this has been prioritized, it's already worked, it's on, or that should be going on, but it's just not funded, is that is that why? I don't know if I can answer that question. I, I remember a bit of the background, yeah. I can take this if you, um, so in 2020, when the, the mobile home park general plan designation was created and then applied to the two mobile home parks most at risk, it was also removed from the council priority list at that time. And then we we placed this item on the housing crisis work plan to track the implementation. Um, but, it, you know, since the, the major policy work related to the mobile home parks was completed, that's why it was taken off the um, council priority list at the time. That was before the, the roadmap uh, was created. Okay, I guess I am concerned because you know, obviously, we just we spent a good amount of time discussing the budget, and then we discussed, uh, spent an afternoon discussing the backlog items, and you know, and we're we're potentially you know adding even more work uh, to the to the plate, and and yet in that discussion, right, um, wasn't surfaced. Hey, by the way, this particular set of of work. That the council has already supported being done is still left unfunded. So in essence, it, I think it you know it should should have been denoted as backlogged work or shelved work, right? That that is sitting there waiting until we we get some funding for it. So it may not be you know needing to be prioritized to get done. It's just prioritized to get funding. But uh, nonetheless, I, I think that um, fortunately we're still uh, a day and a half away before budget documents are due. So I can. Uh, you know, ask my team to craft one, <laughs> but um, but I think that it it would have been better somehow with an item like this to enter that discussion um, and to be aware that you know, hey, this work that we may f I know I felt was you know was was going to be um, prioritized and, and and find its way to be concluded that it's basically sitting on a shelf until the council makes a separate decision to fund the the work. And so um, I'm glad we're having that discussion today, but I'm 
you know, I, I wouldn't have been so happy, say, for instance, if this meeting was next week and, you know, now we're sort of beyond the, where, where a budget document is due. So I think that it's, we got to marry up some of the, the, the work that is yet to be done or work like this that maybe is yet to be funded. We should marry that up into the conversations that we, that we have around the budget. So then that way we can actually understand, you know, um, should we be trying to add more work to the list or, or asking for particular one-off projects to be funded, or should we be asking for things that have already been passed, you know, voted on, prioritized, and now they're just waiting on some funding. So, um, cause I do think this is extremely important work and I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we identified the two most vulnerable mobile home parks, but there are now uh, a couple other mobile home parks, one in particular that is vulnerable. And I'd, I'd like to, you know, sort of see that we continue this work to, to get through the remaining ones. So, um, I got some work to do before Wednesday, it looks like. Okay, thanks. And Council Member Perales, this is Rosalind Huey. Uh, I, I just can certainly understand your concern and just wanted to add a little bit on to what Jared um, had previously shared. Just a reminder that, you know, the City Council did prioritize those two mobile home parks because they had a land use designation um, at a high density, so they were seen at risk. And, and just a reminder, we do, the city does have a very good protection for all of our mobile home parks, and that is our conversion ordinance. And so these, for these remaining home mobile home parks that have uh, a lower um, density land use designation, they would have to come into the city and, and abide by um, that conversion ordinance because they're, they don't have a high enough density land use designation to do any major redevelopment. Um, and that was part of the reason why staff did, um, you know, indicate back in 2020 that since we had dealt with the two most at risk that we had considered that city council priority completed. Um, so just wanted to add that context as well. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, and there's obviously a lot that that uh, has gone on between then and now, and a lot obviously that we discuss and vote on. So I appreciate the historical context on that. I, I still think it's important work to be concluded. And honestly, I just, I guess, you know, up until today's discussion, wasn't aware that it just really required the council to make a budgetary decision that says, hey, let's let's fund this work if we want it done. Um, and it sounds like that's the that's the big hurdle here. So um, I think we can we can make that decision uh, in the coming weeks. I, I appreciate the discussion around the mobile home parks and, and the comments, uh, Rosalind, around the conversion ordinance, but it's really the mobile home uh, park uh, occupants who uh, will give them peace of mind when we do this zoning change. And I, I think this is what it's primarily about because they're concerned that things can change around them without them having much influence. So I too wasn't aware that this was a budget budgetary issue and that's why we hadn't gone forward. So um, I need to think about how I might want to position that as well. Uh, Council Member Mahan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask maybe a couple of questions about how we're interpreting the goal and, and how we are interpreting our progress toward the goal. So as I understood it many, you know, five years ago now reading about the uh, the mayor's twenty five thousand unit goal in the paper, and and what I even read in the memo today indicates that the goal was to deliver twenty five thousand units, which to me and I think to the public meant actually build. And and what I see here, if I'm correct, is that over that time frame we actually delivered or completed about five thousand units or about twenty percent of the goal, which to me is. As we all know, this is why we're in a crisis. Is you know, big alarm bells going off, and so I'm just I'm curious if I've missed something or if if that's correct. If what what is our definition of delivering these units? And and I'm the reason I raise this. Let me just add a little more context. Is that much of the tone that that I've seen in reports over the last year and a half about this goal and our housing crisis work plan has been well, we're on track with market rate. And so, you know, we seem to really focus on affordable and I'm, I'm all for focusing on affordable. We know there are some real funding limitations there and, and other challenges, but um, I'm not sure we should be interpreting that any of this is going particularly well, frankly. 
And so I, I just want to make sure we, we're on the, we're kind of level setting properly. So I'll, I'll pause there. I may have some follow-up questions, but it seems to me that from what we were hoping to do five years ago, we're actually pretty far off. Yeah, thanks, Council Member. Um, just so on the on the, the first part, um, the the way that it, it was it was put in the the um, housing crisis work plan is units that have received planning approval, so entitlement units under construction, which is um, building permit received or completed. So the unit number was always counted in that way. I understand what your question is, and I think that's why you know our reference is you know why we need to continue to do work on you know and continue the work that we've done in the work plan going in, into 2023 i would also just say you know the, the work plan itself has always been you know centered or focused on policies to encourage production you know with the understanding that it's you know the, the market that really delivers housing and so our you know while we we definitely can have an impact it's still you know there are a lot of other factors outside of our control um, and so just keeping that in mind as well in terms of our ability to, to deliver or not deliver. So it, it looks like Nancy might have something to add there as well. So <laughs> there you go. I just wanted, thank you very much. Just wanted to um, take the opportunity to, I guess, state the obvious. We have done as much as we have control over. And the challenge is much as Rachel shared with the fi locking finance for those affordable projects, the market rate projects, because of three issues primarily, financing, the costs, and then the rents. Uh, certainly through the pandemic, um, as Jared mentioned, even though we've all heard stories about um, rents being high, they're not still not quite caught up to 2020, uh, but the costs for construction are very high. And as you know, recently, unfortunately, interest rates are starting to creep up. So the things that we have tools to address, um, we have done a, a, a good job on getting through. Um, when you council member really are aware, there's some challenges to getting things done on time. Um, other goals, uh, we would have to explore and see if at all we could impact those. Financing would be extremely difficult for us to, to incent. Yeah, no, no I, I appreciate the, the significant challenges here. And, and I, I don't wanna be clear, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, I, I'm not trying to wallow in, in uh, failure. I, I, I want us to just be accurately assessing what has happened, what we've learned, where we are. And, and as we head into this conversation in the fall, where we evaluate, where we look back on the five years and we say, okay, what, what worked, what didn't, I, I just want to make sure we are really thoroughly anal and honestly analyzing this. And I'm, I'm not saying that um, anyone here has done anything wrong. It's a really challenging environment. And as you say, we don't have total control over the outcome. I think that's, that certainly needs to be stated. At the same time, I'm not sure everyone would agree we've done absolutely everything within our power to facilitate housing construction in San Jose. I think there's kind of a range of potential levers and you know, some of us wanna pull some of those levers and, and not others. And, and I don't like every possible solution. And I don't think any of us you know, would, would wanna do everything, every possible thing we could do because we'd have to, the, the trade-offs might be too great, but, but there are, always options. And um, I think if we had a panel of home builders here on the call today, and we asked them, has San Jose done absolutely everything it possibly could have in the last five years to enable home building in San Jose, I doubt they would all say, yes, we've done absolutely everything we could. So I think it's just an important conversation. We had hoped, you know, I think that at least the public, just to be clear, I think the public understanding was, we're trying to do 25,000 units over five years or 5,000 new units a year looks like we delivered about a thousand. Now we know there are challenges. I'm not bringing that up to try to, uh, again, dwell on negativity. It's more about what are we hearing from the market that, what, what other levers? I mean, I guess what I'm, what I'm reflecting on out loud here is I hope that when we have this conversation in the fall, we talk very bluntly about the challenges and lay out whatever menu of options there might be to, to be even more aggressive about incentivizing the building that we want in San Jose 
where we want it, I think particularly within urban villages. And, um, and just, you know, be, be willing to have that, that conversation because I worry that, that the implication is, well, we, we met the market rate goal, which, which implies that we're doing great. And I don't think any of us would, would say that we think we're doing great on, on meeting our housing needs. And so I just, I wanted to flag that because I, I don't think that is a correct framing of this. I just wanna make sure we're gonna have a really productive conversation in the fall. Jared, sorry, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, sorry, I just had two two things. I, I understand definitely where you're coming from. I think two two things to 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 add. You know, well, the cost of development report. You know, which we've done two other iterations. We have it coming back in August to the council. You right. know, it's number one on the work plan. I think is a very important tool to to be able to to give you know staff and the council the ability to kind of understand all the factors that are influencing development and make choices. You know, based on those, on that report. And then second, just in terms of the metric and the goal. I think, you know, moving to the arena numbers rather than kind of the 25,000 unit was, was, you know, intentional because I think we feel like that that's really a better metric to go off of and what we should, be, I mean, that's what we're saying we're going to build in, in the next cycle. That's the number that we should be using and, it, and it's, you know, a little bit more of a solid number rather than kind of in the three, the three camps. So. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That, it makes sense to align around what we're already agreeing to or slash getting from the state um, on just on that point is, isn't our uh, next arena cycle something over 60,000 units is that correct 62,000 yeah that's kind of a big number guys so at this rate we'll need 60,000 60 years is that all <laughs> clearly we're gonna have to find some new levers to pull to make this happen hopefully with unblocking North San Jose being uh, high on the list. But uh, okay, well, again, I, I appreciate, I, I know you all have been working incredibly hard in the trenches for a very long time. I'm, I'm not, again, I, I don't bring up or point to this uh, to, to be negative. I, I wanna make sure we are analyzing this as, as, and that we on the council are, are really getting the, the good, the bad, the ugly of this and understand what if any options we have to be even more aggressive. And, and I just, I wanna make sure in the, spirit of candor that we're that we're doing that when we look at these numbers particularly in the fall i think that's going to be an important moment of reflection as we kind of uh think about the next phase of of our work here um i don't believe there's been a motion yet has there no would you okay, care to great. make one yeah i'd like to uh, move acceptance of the report great is there a second i'll second thank you any other questions council member mayhan no, Chair, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Then uh, I have a couple of comments. I, I appreciate the numbers on the, the 25,000, but I think we're missing a big number, and that is, or we're missing including it in affordable housing. And I just want to call attention to the number of ADUs that we have being built. They are affordable by design. I know we don't consider them affordable housing in our affordable housing numbers, but I truly believe we should. And I know they are not deed restricted. And I know that's how we look at the affordable housing units, but they are affordable in the nature of their size and their construction costs. So I would encourage us to look at that, the ADU numbers with a, uh, uh, and be pleased where our ADU numbers are and adding in a new ADU ally next year through the budget, if, if that gets passed, will also help increase our ADU numbers. Doesn't mean we're meeting our affordable housing goals of 10,000, but it certainly adds to the number of housing stock in the uh, affordable housing realm. So I just wanna, I never wanna lose focus on the ADUs because they're really important count in housing because while big projects, big developments take a long time to go up, an ADU does not. And ADUs can be built in a backyard very, very quickly um, if we have the permitting and staff available. Uh, Rachel, I had a couple questions for you. Um, something you said concerned me a great deal regarding the financing component and SIDLAC. Can you tell me, you said two of four, pro, of four projects have been approved by them, but two of them you feel will be uh, truly funded and go to completion. Can you tell me which two those are and which two are falling off? Yes. So 
the um the two that are um moving forward are the the kelsey which is um let's see that one's in there's a lot of district three actually um, um on north first street right north yes north mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so the Kelsey is, um, I mean, we're, you know, it's a, it's a closing, every closing, you know, has its moments, but it, um, anyway, we anticipate it will close. Okay. Um, the, and by close, you mean funded? Uh, yeah. I mean, but I'm actually okay. saying the whole, um, we'll actually have a loan closing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So all the pieces of financing will come in together right. and it will close. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what I mean. Okay, no, I just so, want to be in the same. I, yes, that's what I understand closing yes. to be. But I just want to be on the same page with you that that's closing because yes. then there's the construction. They get the finance right. right. So that's right. just closing. Yeah. Now we can move forward. Now we can. Okay, move right now we can pull our building permits. So. Okay, and the um, other one, please tell me one of them is in District Nine or don't. Please don't tell me that the two falling <laughs> off are in District Nine. They're not in District Nine. <laughs> so okay the other one moving forward is roosevelt which is over on um, east santa clara so that one is expected to close um and then the two that we are concerned about are el garve which is also um on east santa clara a little closer here to city hall um than roosevelt is and that one um what happened is the the investor for the tax credits um, pulled out recently. And so we're trying to um, find a new investor, but that is, you know, that's something we're doing right now. And we're hoping that that will happen, um, but that is the concern. Um, and then the other one is McAvoy, which is in the Deardon station area. And that one um, really, again, and, and there is, I would just say that these things don't just happen, right? But really it is this the fact that the costs are increasing and then the, the these gaps that are getting created are just more and more difficult to fill with, um, with our financing. And so that's really the biggest challenge that's facing McAvoy right now is just that the costs have really increased and it's been um, challenging to find ways to solve for those new gaps. So those so are the two that we're concerned about. Okay, so for the 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 gaps in in part is being caused by increase in interest rates. In some cases, investors pulling out, which may also be a function of interest rates. And, right. And, yeah. Right. It's, and, it's kind of an environment, right? It's right. an environment where things are just not operating in a in in kind of a predictable way. And then the penalty is huge. So once SIDLAC mm -hmm. approves financing. How much time does a developer have to close the transaction? They have 120 days. And so that's the challenge is that well, um, during that time, these things have, um, these issues, actually, the, if you think about the last 120 days, that's when we've really seen some changes in this environment. Um, and so that's, that's the challenge because they just have 120 days. So again, that's why SIDLAC is having an emergency meeting on Wednesday. They're going to be considering these issues and um, we're just really hoping um, that they may be sympathetic to our situation where even like an additional 90 days could make a big difference um, for some of these deals. Is there something we uh, as council members could do to write letters to SIDLAC, encouraging them to offer an extension uh, modify their terms would would that be helpful that would definitely be helpful um we have typically been working with the mayor's office and the mayor's been really instrumental in helping us with this um, type of thing so we um, will continue to do that and coordinate this week to see if there's um something that we can do there and we would really appreciate your support as well if you had a some talking points or a template or something that we could use, make it easy on the council members, mm -hmm. then we could send something out under our names to okay. SIDLAC and, yeah. and who we send it to, mm -hmm. because this is really critical. That's the finance piece that's missing in completing these affordable housing projects. 
I know in, in, in my district where we haven't had a lot of affordable housing, I have just under a thousand units that are in various stages. Um, uh, one of them's almost ready to be to, for uh, groundbreaking, but they're all in risk of financing too because of rates right now and, and the financing terms. So uh, we don't wanna lose those uh, because some of them are in great locations and we all need, we know we need affordable housing and you obviously can't count them in either the arena goals or the goals that uh, was set five years ago because they're not they're not close they're not they haven't met the the target of our uh, qualifications well anything we can do please let us know and if um, you'd be so kind to send us information that we could then use and and send out that would be really helpful thank you we really appreciate your support okay thank you rachel councilmember perales yeah thank you um just a couple things based on the comments. So first, um, the Algarve, uh, uh, well, happy to hear the other projects in District 3 moving forward. Algarve, though, I know uh, one of the concerns was that uh, they were, you know, obviously preparing to move forward and they they, they did uh, remove two businesses or displace two businesses that were there and how they've kind of been, you know, the property's been sitting vacant for a while. And so hearing that it's, you know, I think almost two years, so hearing that it's, potentially uh, going to be delayed further is a bit concerning. Um, so I'm hoping that that um, can be resolved. Is there any uh, any light at the end of that tunnel there, Rachel, or hope that, you know, that that sort of moves forward? Our hope would be uh, an extension of time for specifically for Algarve. We think that that would be really beneficial. Okay, yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, that's that's uh, definitely, like I said, concerning. And, and and again, the big thing. I mean, we you know, we we want to be able to move as fast as possible on these. But then when when we don't, right? There's all sorts of other challenges, not just the fact that we're not getting affordable housing, but again, in this case, a, a neighborhood that already is struggling with the blight and homelessness and crime and whatnot. And then you have a vacant building for two years that was sitting there waiting, uh, or a couple buildings actually, a couple businesses that they were waiting for a new development to come in. Um, just brings about other additional challenges so and then I, I think you know just speaks to as well the um some of the work that i've been doing over the years to, to try and ensure that we can spread the love around the city with with what we've continually seen just a a, a focus within uh, particular parts of our, our community and so hopefully we'll start to see that as well with some of our signing policy work and and the way that we are now ourselves incentivizing and funding some projects um and i appreciate that our chair councilman foley is is expressing right publicly an eagerness to to be part of that right to be part of that success and have that affordable housing um, you know right be developed out in in, in in D9 and throughout other parts of the city. Um, lastly, this was I just kind of thinking about it after Councilor Mayhan's comments. Um, I think that because we as a city take uh, rightfully so, but but I think take a lot of responsibility uh, in regards to to this crisis as we have deemed it and as we are set out to to try and, and see how we resolve it, um, there becomes a, a a belief from people in our community that, that we actually can solve it, right? And, and, and I think that um, as we know, and as we've talked about even here, just the, the intricacies of one individual project and how, you know, we have no control over this particular mechanism of, of once we've done our job, we've gotten out of the way, for instance, this uh, Algarve project, right? I've got the community on board. We've gone through a process. We've, you know, sort of getting to a point where then, um, you know, this financing or funding or obviously the interest rates, right? That none of us could have predicted and controlled that. And all of a sudden we end up not, you know, getting a project like this or, or, or not getting closer to our goals. And yet I don't, I don't know if there's, was anything, you know, different that we could do, say, in a situation like that, right? And so, and that's where I think that there's, there may be a misconception that we actually can solve this, right? They're like, yeah, sure, we're going to hit the 62,000, you know, um, arena goals <laughs> that, that we have somehow leading on our own, and that, that that's, that's going to be the case. And, and I know that, um, that we're doing a, a lot of work in that, and, and clearly we've, we've set up this priority um, right on, on this housing crisis work plan. I'm curious from 
staff's perspective, is there something that, you know, feedback you want to give us on, hey, um, maybe we, we shouldn't be focused on this kind of work or, you know, or actually we think that there's a tool out there that we haven't used or, or is there a reality of, hey, look, we, we are, you know, truly trying to turn over every stone and, right, and, and at the moment, certain things that are just uh, outside of our capacity um, are in the way. I, I, and I know that this is just the, the, the status report. So we're not going to solve homeless, or excuse me, we're not going to solve the affordable housing crisis uh, in this conversation. But I am curious, um, as we are accepting this status update, any feedback from staff that would be beneficial to us um, so that that way we can continue to, to sort of grow together and, and maybe move in the, in the right direction. Yeah, um, thanks council member. Uh, and that's a good question. I think first, again, just to mention the <clears throat> cost of development report, you know, in, in August, I think that will be uh, a useful item and consideration for staff and council just to kind of look, you know, holistically at <clears throat> market rate development and now the financing all um, stacks together currently. And then I think that there are a number of strategies that we're contemplating in our housing element that, that could have a somewhat significant impact. I, we're not quite ready to, to share those with uh, with you yet, but we're, we're working on them right now. And, you know, they would be a part of that, that housing element draft and part of the, the future, you know, housing crisis work plan that's going to become the housing catalyst team work plan that I think that we think could could have uh, a more significant impact. And so I think those are two things that I would say. I don't know if, if Michael or Rachel has anything to add. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do recognize I'm jumping the gun a little bit, right? I know this work is coming, um, right? It's just curious on, on, on some of that feedback. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I was. So it is really frustrating. It's frustrating for us too. you know, this is our job, right? We're gonna, we really want to solve this because we're losing staff to cheaper housing areas. It's more very pragmatically. Um, and I think it's it's very challenging. I mean, I think the S, the opportunity housing analysis we did, as controversial as that was, uh, very much mirrored the Turner Center of analysis of SB9, which is we're really not going to see much of that type of housing built, as controversial as it is. Um, and as I'm sure many people don't want it to be built, but the reality is you probably won't see much of it built. What was really interesting, though, is about the analysis of strategic economics and opportunity housing is it tested a typology of the smaller apartment building, the kind of building that was built here in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, the you know sixplex and eightplexes that started to get into an area of uh, financial feasibility and also to bit, uh, some extent being more naturally affordable. And that's a housing product that we really don't allow right now in San Jose. I mean, we, we allow single family homes and we allow medium and high density development. There's not a lot in between. ADUs are sort of the exception that's our, I agree with the council member um, uh, fully on that. That's, that's really, you know, they're, they're much easier to put the, uh, you know, um, housing uh, construction in the hands of a, of, a, of a homeowner and a small developer, but kind of looking at something that might work in that realm more. Um, you know, and I, I think that's just something to think about as we as we go forward. Is there, you know, is there an opportunity for smaller apartment buildings? Maybe not in urban villages, but in other areas of the city or in that transition between single family and urban villages. So it's something that's been on my mind. I don't think it's going to be, you know, it's going to result in millions of units, frankly, but it is another tool in the toolbox that that might be worth investigating at some point. Well, we only need sixty-two thousand, right? So not we don't we don't need millions. Um, yeah, I don't so. know. I don't know how much. You know, I think I think we need. You know, I don't think it's going to get us like in the next eight years. We wouldn't be getting at five thousand units. But I mean, I think we need as many tools as we can. And ADUs is like the little tiny horse that's out out in front um, that's doing great. And we need more more things like that that we can point to because the 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 type of housing products that our general plan embraces are very complicated, very expensive, and, and very difficult to finance. And so, and they're very much impacted by cost of development. So just thinking about like, is there something in that more middle range that, that we could sort of explore to move forward? Yeah, no, that, that, that is helpful. I, I, I am seeing at least in my, cursory knowledge of SB9 and, and SB10 in combination, which I know is sort of, we're, we're, we're delayed on, on implementation of that, but 
that you could start building something like what you're talking about, right? Eight units or something like that um, using some of those tools. So they, they may actually, you know, today um, I agree based on, on what we've seen from analysis of SB9, it's not likely to, to develop much, um, right? Or have many conversions, but along the lines of what you're talking about, once you start going up a little bit more, maybe eight, um, you know, units or 10 or something like that, then maybe um, we, we tap into this particular um, middle section that we're, we're not, really allowing today and uh, maybe it does you know help make us a, a small dent the same way the adus are because i would agree i mean uh, you, you you have a good analogy there uh it's the, <laughs> the, the small horse there but it's it's kicking butt right and we we need more projects that are out there um or more type of developments i should say that are out there that are that are doing the same um and uh the the, the last bit which obviously uh, it's it's a a unique challenge that we have here in, in San Jose is that where we want to develop high rise in our downtown, we have the high water table and the low ceiling because of planes. So, you know, that's also another challenge. I mean, we, we would have had 40, 50 story buildings already if that weren't the case. And, and that would make the high rises much more um, feasible, right? To, and, 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 and able to be financed um, and to be built. So, uh, you know, we, I think you're, you know, we, we need to understand our challenges as you point out. And then understand where the opportunities are to plug in um, and get some type of you know, housing at a much faster rate. I look forward to the conversations that I know we'll have in, in a couple months here. Um, but I, I do appreciate your, you know, your thoughts, your, your your thoughts on that. You guys are in the middle of this work, um, and you're aware of uh, likely a lot more than we are of 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 what's working, what's not, what's missing. Um, and so I look forward to, to that report coming back to the West. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. You had your hand raised. Did you want to respond? Just two anything? quick things. I, okay. Michael, I, I so appreciate what you were saying. And maybe there's opportunities with heights to find in other areas like the west side that could accommodate more height and finding sites that would be um, not as strongly objected to as we have seen some, because then you can get more yield. But then also one for Rachel, if, if the council were willing, um, Rachel knows super well that dense housing for affordable or otherwise is penalized at the state uh, housing funds level because it costs more per unit. So it would be very useful to have um, prioritization based on putting housing where it's supposed to go uh, and in densities where it's supposed to go, which, which isn't the case at the moment. Thank you, Nancy. With that, let's vote. Carrasco? Aye. Perales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our third item, which is the Development Services Process Improvements and Dashboard Report. Chris Burton, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, we're back and glad to be back with you to talk about uh, our development services process improvements uh, and walk you through the dashboard uh, as it stands. Um, joining me in the presentation today uh, will be Robert Manford and Lisa Joyner, uh, our two deputy directors for planning and building. Uh, we also have a host of other staff on the call so we can answer any in-depth questions you have uh, as we, we go through some of the numbers. Um, so next slide, please. So just to remind you of this real eye test um, that we presented last time, this shocking slide of all these numbers, you know, we continue to really drive towards, um, you know, a, a data informed management style throughout QBCE. So we can start to really understand uh, much more uh, in depth um, perspective of the mechanics of how we're uh, delivering service to all of our customers. Um, so we're tracking numbers on a, a wide spectrum uh, right across the board. Generally speaking, we're continuing to see construction activity increase uh, as we move out of the pandemic. We're starting to see that and we'll talk a little bit more specifically on some of the numbers and kind of where we're seeing that and how we're being impacted. Um, but today um, we're really going to focus on three areas just to kind of give you a sense of kind of what's going on. Um, the first is going to be uh, planning intake and sort of what's going on from the planning process and how we're moving projects into the process. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about building plan review 
um, what's going on on sort of how we review um, the, the permits that are coming in for a building permit. Um, and then lastly, talk about where we're at with inspection, which is really uh, the key indicator on actual construction activity on the ground um, and what we're seeing from that perspective. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to finish up by talking about uh, a little bit about our staffing. You heard from Michael kind of where we're at in our citywide team. We want to talk about where we're at within PBC on the development services side, um, just to give you that perspective. And in addition, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, some updates that are coming from a building perspective and, and what difference that's going to make uh, to our work. Um, so, so let's dive in. I'm going to hand it over to Robert to talk, to talk through the uh, planning perspective. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Robert Manford, Deputy Director for Planning. Uh, two areas that we'll focus on uh, this afternoon have to do with our planning permit center intake functions, which are applications waiting to be processed, and then secondly, email inquiries received each month. Uh, it's important to know that our planning, planning set, permit center generally works on ministerial projects, which a project that otherwise would not be coming to you in, at city council or going to planning commission or even to a uh, director's hearing. Uh, the permit center, as you can see, has one supervisor, uh, seven planners, and then two planning technicians. Uh, as of the end of April, we had an application backlog of 79 and uh, Actually, this is a new law since we started measuring this backlog 10 months ago. Uh, this also represents a 53% decline over the past six months. These applications, which are historically submitted in person in the permit center, actually transitioned to an email box, email inbox. We had a renewed focus on intake backlog for customers, for the planners who are cost recovery, uh, who must actually work on the application process. Conversely, We've also had, an, had a decrease for email increase, which we received about 822 by the end of March. The general email increase are managed by the planning technicians in the permit center. While the decline may look positive, it's likely an outcome of both planning technician positions being vacant from February to April. Uh, since our response time was slow due to these vacancies, we saw an overall decrease in email traffic so there were less back and forth to our initial replies for questions. Uh, I'm glad to report that both planning technician vacancies have now been actually filled. And so going forward, we anticipate seeing more efficiency and uh, an increase in the performance that we've provided today. So uh, hand over to uh, Lisa for the next slide. Thank you, Robert. Good afternoon, Chair Foley and Council Members. Lisa Joyner, Deputy Director for the Building Division. Uh, so first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our building plan review team. It's no secret that we have a backlog in our regular plan review process. Due to retirements and staff departures, we have an over 30% vacancy rate with our associate engineers. The format of regular plan review is not conducive to providing a quick feedback loop for customers and often results in additional rounds of comments. Each round can require action from multiple staff within the division. In an effort to help our customers to reduce pressure on the plan review team and to streamline the review process, we are working to add more permit options into the online permitting system, shifting appropriate applications to our over-the-counter inspection review team, and exploring the expansion and return of our express review operations on the first floor in the permit center. While re-implementing express will require resource shifting from the over-the-counter and plan review teams, the overall increase in review time efficiency should offset any deficit created by the movement. We also have an active associate engineer recruitment underway and we're hopeful we'll be able to start reducing our vacancy numbers. In addition to this, we have an RFP out to obtain more peak staffing agencies that we can contract with. Next slide, please. So our inspection team, for the past two years, first COVID and then supply chain issues slowed construction and therefore the demand for inspections. As a result, on the, the chart 18, you can see our nearly perfect 100% of inspections available within 48 hours. At the same time, we also assigned more inspectors to the over-the-counter plan review team to assist getting permits into the field and under construction and launched a virtual inspection team. 
Inspection demands are cyclical, typically increasing in the summer and decreasing in the winter. The demand increase for 2022 started a bit earlier than we're used to, as you can see by the dips in the available inspection chart. With a 20% vacancy rate in the inspection team, our resources are limited. In March of this year, we began providing Saturday inspections to keep the available scheduling window from increasing out of control. I'd also like to note that while Saturday inspections are overtime for our staff, there is currently no increase in fee for the customer. We have both the combination inspection recruitment and the inspection supervisor recruitment active and are working to reduce the vacancy rate within our inspection team. Next slide, please. So our building codes. It's important to remember that the California building codes update on a three-year cycle and we are in a code change year. The 2022 California building codes go into effect on January 1st, 2023 and must be adopted before that date. We typically see a big rush of applicants wanting to submit their building permit applications prior to the code change and those applications need to be in our hands prior to January 1st. The December holiday closure makes it a bit challenging to achieve this, but we make every accommodation possible to help those with completed permit applications get in before the deadline. It does, however, create an increased demand for intake and plan review services at the end of the year, at the beginning of next year. And I will give it back to Chris. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so just to close out, I just want to talk a little bit more about kind of where we stand with our current staffing by comparison to uh, the last time we reported. So you may recall we showed you a similar slide uh, back in February. Um, we have absolutely made uh, hiring a priority within the department. Um, it's been a priority on an ongoing basis, um, but certainly doing everything we can to reduce any barriers that we find in our workflows or within the department to actually getting people in positions. Uh, as a result, we have made some gains, uh, certainly in planning. Our permit center uh, has filled all of the, the, the vacancies there, and our development review team has also uh, reduced the vacancy rate significantly. As you heard from Michael earlier, um, we are still experiencing vacancy across the board, and I think the important statistic to bear in mind um, is that although we're sort of keeping that vacancy rate low, uh, we are seeing a lot of turnover. Um, and so where we're, we're losing people, we're losing institutional knowledge and memory. And so um, thinking through strategies and, and plans on how we offset that uh, in our onboarding process and our ongoing training and development is going to be critical to our long-term success. Um, and then throughout building, uh, while we've made some gains uh, in the permit center with um, uh, some additions, and, and what this chart doesn't reflect is through that period, we also had a considerable number of retirements, so just nature of the, the timing of the year. Um, so while it looks like we may have only ad added one or two positions here or there, um, the turnover, again, has been probably slightly more significant. Um, but as you can see, and as Lisa was mentioning, uh, you know, we have significant challenges in plan review. Uh, and as we move towards the end of the year on that code cycle, uh, that, that's something that we're super cognizant of. Uh, and, and keeping a very close eye on, um, like Lisa said, we're sort of actively working those recruitments to help fill those positions. Um, and then in addition, an inspection. Um, and so finding uh, qualified candidates that are a good fit for our inspection process, um, you know, continues to be challenging. Um, and so it's something that we're working on, thinking through our process and then thinking through our ability to onboard um, once we have uh, folks in that pipeline. Um, and that's all we have for today uh, from the numbers perspective. Uh, as I said, uh, we have a whole host of folks with us who can help answer any questions you have on the specifics. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'll turn to members of the public per first. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for this item. Uh, urban villages is what I was trying to mention in the previous item that I think can relate to this item in a way in that, uh, you know, the future of urban village planning and its needs for to be a more efficient process and its permitting, um, I question that and I worry about that and I'm not totally in favor of it and I hope that can be very closely monitored. I don't think we should go headlong into the wonders of, of uh, streamlining urban planning permitting in the future, basically. I think we have to be very cautious in how we proceed. Uh, that should just be a standard good practices, I think. The other item I wanted to, to mention uh, is how, say, the CEQA process can be a part of this future development uh, package and, and thinking. 
and we're making streamlining uh, ideas with CEQA right now. A reminder that you know, as you when you first approve of a, a, a project with CEQA, it's important to have a review process after say six months or a year, and really check up on you know, are the environmental what are the environmental impacts that are happening from our, the initial approval process, and really take note of it, learn important lessons, and and develop better environmental strategies for the future. Um, I mean, that's the goal, I think, of this streamlining process is to really learn from our mistakes and really find ways to make important environmental concerns relevant in, in the future development of uh, permitting and the CEQA process. And if you can do those two things, that's, that's growing, that's growth, and that's good practices. Good luck, thank you. Thank you. Turning to the committee, does anyone have any questions or wish to make a motion to accept the report? I'll move to accept the report. Thank you. Councilmember Perales, is there a second? Second. Chair, I also have my hand up just for a quick comment, if that's yes, okay. Yes, by all means. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And I just, Chris and team, I just want to thank you for the dashboards. I know that's cliche coming from me, but I, I do think, you know, having a sense of how we're tracking is really helpful. Um, it is a lot to consume. And so I'll, I'll probably take some time to go through the charts uh, offline and just circle back to you after the meeting with a few questions. But I appreciate that we are sort of isolating our performance and some of the key drivers like vacancy, tracking progress over time, and, and then explicitly tying your update here to what you're doing to make sure that we have measurable improvement. So I, I just wanted to say thank you. I, I think, I know we're, we're continuing to flex this muscle and get better and better at it. And it's just a constant learning experience, but I'm, I'm grateful for all the effort the department is making to go in this uh, kind of more data-driven direction. Certainly helpful from my perspective as somebody who's trying to, to support your work and, and provide some basic uh, you know, feedback. And, and so anyway, just thanks. Thank you for the report and look forward to follow-up conversations offline. Thank you. Uh, also, I'd like to thank you for the report as well and the detailed analysis of where you are and where you're going, particularly as it relates to the vacancies. I know that's really impacting your work. Uh, and we, as council members, hear from our residents all the time about construction projects and how they're uh, being delayed or why are they being delayed? What's the, the cause? So having this analysis of this information really arms us with the information we need to go back to our community and uh, manage expectations a little bit with them. So th thank you for the report. I see no other hands raised, so let's vote. Carrasco? Hi. Corrales? Yes. Mayhem? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And the last report is on COVID related impacts to employees at the airport. This is an update. And I understand that John, a John, are you with us or who's, who's yeah. giving us it? Sure. Yes, John there he is. Can... Okay. Very good. Uh, Thank you for coming back, John. No problem. Uh, John Aiken, Director of Aviation. Uh, today, we're bringing you uh, back the COVID issues with employees at the airport. Uh, we did a presentation on January 24th. Uh, the committee asked us to conduct a little extra outreach with the employees in the union, and we're here to report back what we found when we talked to them. So uh, we had meetings with the union. We met with three representatives of Unite here. Uh, they represent the employees from HMS Host, which is one of the food and beverage uh, concessionaires, and Hudson, which is the retail concessionaire. We also met with the employees. We had four open forum meetings to talk with them directly. Uh, they were scheduled at various times over two days because these people work shift work, so we made it so that they could come to the meetings. They were also offered in hybrid so that they could Zoom from home or whatever so that they could get in and talk with us. Um, we put the meeting information out to the union, to the tenant manager, put signs in the terminals to say, these are the dates, these are the times, come talk to the, the airport staff about this. 
Um, and we're, we're continuing the, this opportunity for them to continue to talk with us uh, through the different times. Um, the meetings with the union, I just wanted to go through their concerns and, and whether or not we had a response for them right away. Uh, their, their concerns were the pandemic's been hard on their workers. They want to see a recovery, uh, focuses on sensible wages and good health care and pension. Uh, we didn't have any response to any of those that uh, normal union work. Uh, want regular meetings with airport staff. So we agreed to quarterly meetings between the union and the airport staff to talk about issues before they become larger issues. Um, they had uh, questions about when are the new concessions will be opening. Um, we, we told them that we'll keep them informed about the schedule. You know, COVID has delayed a lot of construction out at the airport. Um, but even more important than that, we can't even fully staff the concessions we have that are open. And so it's really uh, an employee shortage issue that's holding us back right now. They'd like to see the customer service training increase. Uh, and that had been canceled during the pandemic. So staff is looking at reinstating the customer service training. Uh, the unions were concerned for safety of their workers. Uh, and you can see a couple things there. Obviously, passengers don't have to wear the masks anymore, uh, and therefore, staff, the concessionaire staff don't have to police the mask wearing. Um, they had uh, questions about city living wage versus airport living wage versus their union contract. We, we tried to explain the differences between all three. Um, they acknowledged the worker shortage, the union did, and said they'd like to help find additional workers. We were very happy to hear that. We do some job fairs, so the union is going to try and work with us on rallying the troops, you know, during these job fairs so we can get more uh, employees out here. When it came to the employee meeting, well, they're, they're, these are kind of in priority order as far as number of times it was mentioned. Homeless individuals at the airport, creating a security and safety issues. Um, we've talked to them about that. Uh, we have more monitoring of the, of the situation. The employees that park in the Terminal A garage, all of them can park there. There's an enclosed walkway into the building. So even if you're in Terminal B, you can go through the checkpoint at A and be inside the building walking to your, your concession. So you're not out on the sidewalk, walking along the sidewalk where there might be the homeless trying to give them a safer route in. Um, they had concerns about road safety crossing the streets at the airport. Uh, we have several crosswalk improvements going on right now. And again, we talked to them about the sky bridge at Terminal A from the parking garage up and over the road uh, into the Terminal A. Um, they talked a little bit about having to assist customers with directions and stuff. Um, my opinion, that's kind of part of their job. So in that customer service training that we're going to re reignite, uh, they'll be talking about how to engage with the customer on, on uh, common questions, like where's gate 23? And, and uh, I think all employees out here, concession or our employees, should be in the mindset to help the customer when they ask. Um, some more employee meeting questions. Um, getting to work. Uh, the buses have multiple stops. We explained the bus route to them. They were getting on the wrong bus. So it was a bus that would go out to the long-term lot and then come around to the terminal. So we explained that to them. Um, the TSA lines can be really long, you know, when, they're, when they show up for work. And this has been going on for years. All employees with an employee badge can go up the first class lane and skip all the way to the front to get to the TDC to go through the checkpoint without waiting. The staff, I guess the concession staff didn't realize that. So we reiterated that to them and to the union to make sure they understand they don't have to wait in line for 20 minutes to get through the checkpoint to get to work. Um, the employees also asked the question on airport living wage, city living wage, and what I make from my union contract. And so the, the team tried to explain the differences again to them. They had questions about the COVID sick pay, the second round of COVID sick pay. Um, and the law was actually passed after the meeting, but it's 
uh, retroactive. And we had told them to stay in contact with the union, that they would be able to tell them how to work the COVID sick leave uh, if, if they got uh, COVID during that period. Um, then they had a question on employee parking and why do some companies subsidize it and some don't. And we said this is a company specific decision. It might be a great union negotiating point, you know, so maybe talk to your, if, it, if that's an issue, you know, talk to your union about it when they're negotiating the next contract. Great opportunity to, you know, throw that into the mix. Um, and then finally, we, we left the door open. Um, Unite here and the staff will have the quarterly meeting. Um, employees know how to get a hold of Magdalena. We left the signs up with Magdalena's information in the employee elevators, in the back halls by the offices, so that they can go, oh yeah, I wanted to talk to her. There's her email or there's her phone number, so that we continue to bring in the employee concerns before they uh, become more of an issue. Uh, so I, you know, we kind of kept our communication open with them, uh, and that's the end of our our feedback from uh, from the meeting. So we're happy to take questions and go from there. John, this is really a great report. It, it seems like you resolved a lot of issues that were uh, just little, just things festering with the employees that. They didn't understand how they could speed, go through the speed line at TSA and uh, parking in other areas. It sounds like you really had some, some good and productive meetings there. Okay, I will turn to members of the public. I see no hands raised, so I'm going to go to the committee. Um, uh, Chair, it looks like Blair raised his hands right after you said that. Okay. Blair? Thank you for seeing my hand. Uh, Cindy Chavez works really quickly like that, and she doesn't allow that usually. Thank you that you saw it and, and were able to correct it. Thank you. Um, yeah, for this item, boy, I'm, I am going to go out on a bit of a limb here. And so I, I just to prepare yourselves and thank you for your patience. Uh, you know, it's my feeling that the San Jose airport, they're kind of in a unique place where they kind of experiment sometimes with new technology and ideas and how that can, uh, you know, work itself out that can better take place in the future of a community. Um, AOPR data collection. Blair, this is about the employees and the uh, the meeting with the employees. Can you keep your comments focused on that? I'm 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 speaking on on items, yeah, related to employee health and 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 decency and safety. And what I'm trying to say is that you know there's an overall theme of the AOPR work based on the civil rights and civil protection ideas at the airport compared to the rest of the city that's been unique. It's given really important lessons that I feel are vital to morale and good spirits. And currently, you know, I feel there's issues of, um, you know, the feature of biometric camera use at the airport and the use of uh, aerosol vaccines for COVID that are used more at the airport that aren't so much in the regular public that I think we can learn important lessons from. And that I think should be kind of a, an idea we can learn to talk about more openly like how biometric camera use, um, you know, in this day and age with open public policies and accountability can be an easier subject to talk about and navigate and make clear for all of us. So um, good luck how we can do that. And, and, and with the uh, aerosol vaccine process also, uh, it's subject matter that, that should be talked about and public comment time is a good place to be allowed to be able to do that so we can feel easier to talk about these subjects in the future more clearly. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Turning to the, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more uh, public speaker, Louise Auerhahn. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. And thank you for this report. I'm glad to hear that uh, there has been some progress. There's been outreach and conversations with at least one of the unions and with workers. I know that there was some, some struggles to get that far. So I'm glad to see that there is dialogue and progress being made. Uh, I think there's a lot more to be done uh, to restore worker morale and a sense of, I say, respect and 
ability to maintain careers at the airport. Um, so I'd encourage you to continue doing this. I think the quarterly meetings will be a big help. Uh, maybe quarterly reports to this committee could be useful as well. And I'd also like to point out that there is more than one union at the San Jose airport. Uh, there's Unite Here, USWW, the Teamsters, I believe a couple others. They certainly all collaborate and work together. Uh, but I think that there's a lot broader spectrum of workers and probably more to be done with those and the new workers to ensure that we really are providing decent work for our employees and the people who make our airport run. Uh, I also think there are some deeper issues. Um, when the workers asked about the living wage, I suspect they were not looking for an explanation of why their wage is lower than people in other parts of the city, but ways that their wage could not be so low. Right now, some of them make barely above living wage, and that may well be contributing to the, the issues with hiring and recruitment. Uh, so thank you for the report, and hopefully this will be the start of a longer conversation and more progress. Thank you. Moving to the committee, I don't see any hands raised. Is there a motion to accept the report? I'll move, I'll move to accept the oh, I'll second. Okay. Thank you okay. for the reporting. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Let's vote. Carrasco? Aye. Perales? Aye. Yes. Mahan? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. So concludes our meeting. And now we turn to members of the public for open forum. Uh, if there are any hands raised, then please, th this is open forum to address any items that we have not discussed in the committee sec in the committee meeting already. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks. I've, I've kind of made it uh, regular uh, that Bye. I think, uh, you know, in the past few months that all sides, I think, can really work towards negotiation and peace in the future of the Ukraine area. And what's interesting in saying these words, uh, you know, as for such an international issue, is that it can be brought down to the level of, of the work we do at the local level at this time of reimagine health and human services, openness and accountability practices, I think can be really important examples that, I mean, the future of the community is just vital to the future of Ukraine. I mean, all sides can agree to that, I think. Why not we start working on those concepts now that we can use our good local examples here that can really be of help and service to how they're gonna have to rebuild Ukraine eventually. And uh, just good luck in, in, in those good efforts. And, and to also speak to the efforts of uh, just overall building good international relations, you know, we're trying to, work with Cuba at this time and understand how we can work with Cuba again and make our relationships normal and normalized and, and just our regular day-to-day -day international practices and not treat Cuba as the boogeyman. And I think we really have to work on that concept and we're at a time to do that. And it, it's normalizing things that we, we make so superstitious and fearful that you know, nine times out of 10 can simply be talked to rationally and with good reasoning and, you know, good relations can develop from there. And that's important that we do that in this country at this time. I think that's an important goal for the summer and overall good practices for this summer of better communication that we can do at the local level, I think will produce some really interesting things by this fall. So good luck to ourselves in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other hands raised. With that, uh, this meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. See you next month.